Somerset Maugham's short story, Honolulu, the wise traveller travels only in imagination. An old Frenchman, he was really a Savoyard, once wrote a book called Voyage au Tour de Ma Chambre. I have not read it and do not even know what it is about, but the title stimulates my fancy. In such a journey, I could circumnavigate the globe. An icon by the chimney piece can take me to Russia with its great forests of birch and its white domed churches. The Volga is wide, and at the end of a straggling village in the wine shop, bearded men in rough sheepskin coats sit drinking. I stand on the little hill from which Napoleon first saw Moscow, and I look upon the vastness of the city. I will go down and see the people whom I know more intimately than so many of my friends, Alyosha and Vronsky, and a dozen more. But my eyes fall on a piece of porcelain, and I smell the acrid odours of China. I am born in a chair along a narrow causeway between the paddy fields, or else I skirt a tree-clad mountain. My bearers chat gaily as they trudge along in the bright morning, and every now and then, distant and mysterious, I hear the deep sound of a monastery bell. In the streets of Peking there is a motley crowd, and it scatters to allow passage to a string of camels, stepping delicately, that bring skins and strange drugs from the stony deserts of Mongolia. In England, in London, there are certain afternoons in winter when the clouds hang heavy and low, and the light is so bleak that your heart sinks, but then you can look out of your window, and you see the coconut trees crowded upon the beach of a coral island. The sand is silvery, and when you walk along in the sunshine, it is so dazzling that you can hardly bear to look at it. Overhead, the minor birds are making a great to-do, and the surf beats ceaselessly against the reef. Those are the best journeys, the journeys that you take at your own fireside, for then you lose none of your illusions. But there are people who take salt in their coffee. They say it gives it a tang, a savour, which is peculiar and fascinating. In the same way there are certain places, surrounded by a halo of romance, to which the inevitable disillusionment which you must experience on seeing them gives a singular spice. You had expected something wholly beautiful, and you get an impression which is infinitely more complicated than any that beauty can give you. It is like the weakness in the character of a great man which may make him less admirable, but certainly makes him more interesting. Nothing had prepared me for Honolulu. It is so far away from Europe. It is reached after so long a journey from San Francisco. So strange and so charming associations are attached to the name that at first I could hardly believe my eyes. I do not know that I had formed in my mind any very exact picture of what I expected, but what I found caused me a great surprise. It is a typical western city. Shacks are cheek by jowl with stone mansions. Dilapidated frame houses stand next door to smart stores with plate glass windows. Electric cars rumble noisily along the streets, and motors, Fords, Buicks, Packards line the pavement. The shops are filled with all the necessities of American civilization. Every third house is a bank, and every fifth the agency of a steamship company. Along the streets crowd an unimaginable assortment of people. The Americans, ignoring the climate, wear black coats and high, starched collars, straw hats, soft hats and bowlers. The Kanakas, pale brown with crisp hair, have nothing on but a shirt and a pair of trousers, but the half-breeds are very smart with flaring ties and patent leather boots. The Japanese, with their obsequious smile, are neat and trim in white duck, while their women walk a step or two behind them in native dress with a baby on their backs. The Japanese children, in bright coloured frocks, their little heads shaven, look like quaint dolls. Then there are the Chinese. The men, fat and prosperous, wear their American clothes oddly, but the women are enchanting with their tightly dressed black hair, so neat that you feel it can never be disarranged, and they are very clean in their tunics and trousers, white or powder blue or black. Lastly, there are the Filipinos, the men in huge straw hats, the women in bright yellow muslin with great puffed sleeves. It is the meeting place of East and West. 
the very new rubs shoulders with the immeasurably old. And if you have not found the romance you expected, you have come upon something singularly intriguing. All these strange people live close to each other, with different languages and different thoughts. They believe in different gods, and they have different values. Two passions alone they share, love and hunger. And somehow, as you watch them, you have an impression of extraordinary vitality. Though the air is so soft and the sky so blue, you have, I know not why, a feeling of something hotly passionate that beats like a throbbing pulse through the crowd. Though the native policeman at the corner, standing on a platform with a white club to direct the traffic, gives the scene an air of respectability, you cannot but feel that it is a respectability only of the surface. A little below there is darkness and mystery. It gives you just that thrill, with a little catch at the heart, that you have when at night in the forest the silence trembles on a sudden with the low, insistent beating of a drum. You are all expectant of I know not what. If I have dwelt on the incongruity of Honolulu, it is because just this, to my mind, gives its point to the story I want to tell. It is a story of primitive superstition, and it startles me that anything of the sort should survive in a civilization which, if not very distinguished, is certainly very elaborate. I cannot get over the fact that such incredible things should happen, or at least be thought to happen, right in the middle, so to speak, of telephones, tram cars, and daily papers. And the friend who showed me Honolulu had the same incongruity which I felt from the beginning was its most striking characteristic. He was an American named Winter, and I had brought a letter of introduction to him from an acquaintance in New York. He was a man between forty and fifty, with scanty black hair, grey at the temples, and a sharp-featured, thin face. His eyes had a twinkle in them, and his large horn spectacles gave him a demureness which was not a little diverting. He was tall rather than otherwise and very spare. He was born in Honolulu, and his father had a large store which sold hosiery and all such goods, from tennis rackets to tarpaulins, as a man of fashion could require. It was a prosperous business, and I could well understand the indignation of Winter Pre when his son, refusing to go into it, had announced his determination to be an actor. My friend spent twenty years on the stage, sometimes in New York, but more often on the road, for his gifts were small. But at last, being no fool, he came to the conclusion that it was better to sell sock suspenders in Honolulu than to play small parts in Cleveland, Ohio. He left the stage and went into the business. I think after the hazardous existence he had lived so long, he thoroughly enjoyed the luxury of driving a large car and living in a beautiful house near the golf course, and I am quite sure, since he was a man of parts, he managed the business competently. But he could not bring himself entirely to break his connection with the arts, and since he might no longer act, he began to paint. He took me to his studio and showed me his work. It was not at all bad, but not what I should have expected from him. He painted nothing but still life, very small pictures, perhaps eight by ten, and he painted very delicately with the utmost finish. He had evidently a passion for detail. His fruit pieces reminded you of the fruit in a picture by Gil and Dasho. While you marvelled a little at his patience, you could not help being impressed by his dexterity. I imagine that he failed as an actor because his effects, carefully studied, were neither bold nor broad enough to get across the footlights. I was entertained by the proprietary yet ironical air with which he showed me the city. He thought in his heart that there was none in the United States to equal it, but he saw quite clearly that his attitude was comic. He drove me round to the various buildings and swelled with satisfaction when I expressed a proper admiration for their architecture. He showed me the houses of rich men. That's the Stubbs house, he said. It cost a hundred thousand dollars to build. The Stubbs are one of our best families. Old man Stubbs came here as a missionary more than seventy years ago. He hesitated a little and looked at me with twinkling eyes through his big round spectacles. All our best families are missionary families, he said. You're not very much in Honolulu unless your father or your grandfather converted the heathen. Is that so? Do you know your Bible? Fairly, I answered. 
There is a text which says, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. I guess it runs differently in Honolulu. The fathers brought Christianity to the Kanaka, and the children jumped his land. Heaven helps those who help themselves, I murmured. It surely does. By the time the natives of this island had embraced Christianity, they had nothing else they could afford to embrace. The kings gave the missionaries land as a mark of esteem, and the missionaries bought land by way of laying up treasure in heaven. It surely was a good investment. One missionary left the business, I think one may call it a business without offence, and became a land agent, but that is an exception. Mostly it was their sons who looked after the commercial side of the concern. Oh, it's a fine thing to have a father who came here fifty years ago to spread the faith. But he looked at his watch. Gee, it stopped. That means it's time to have a cocktail. We sped along an excellent road, bordered with red hibiscus, and came back into the town. Have you been to the Union Saloon? Not yet. We'll go there. I knew it was the most famous spot in Honolulu, and I entered it with a lively curiosity. You get to it by a narrow passage from King Street, and in the passage are offices, so that thirsty souls may be supposed bound for one of these just as well as for the saloon. It is a large square room, with three entrances, and opposite the bar, which runs the length of it, two corners have been partitioned off into little cubicles. Legend states that they were built so that King Kalakaua might drink there without being seen by his subjects, and it is pleasant to think that in one or other of these he may have sat over his bottle, a coal-black potentate with Robert Louis Stevenson. There is a portrait of him, in oils, in a rich gold frame, but there are also two prints of Queen Victoria. On the walls, besides, are old line engravings of the 18th century, one of which, and heaven knows how it got there, is after a theatrical picture by de Wilde. And there are oleographs from the Christmas supplements of the graphic and the illustrated London news of twenty years ago. Then there are advertisements of whiskey, gin, champagne and beer, and photographs of baseball teams and of native orchestras. The place seemed to belong not to the modern, hustling world that I had left in the bright street outside, but to one that was dying. It had the savour of the day before yesterday. Dingy and dimly lit, it had a vaguely mysterious air, and you could imagine that it would be a fit scene for shady transactions. It suggested a more lurid time, when ruthless men carried their lives in their hands and violent deeds diapered the monotony of life. When I went in, the saloon was fairly full. A group of businessmen stood together at the bar, discussing affairs, and in a corner two Kanakas were drinking. Two or three men who might have been storekeepers were shaking dice. The rest of the company plainly followed the sea. They were captains of tramps, first mates, and engineers. Behind the bar, busily making the Honolulu cocktail for which the place was famous, served two large half-castes in white, fat, clean-shaven and dark-skinned, with thick, curly hair and large, bright eyes. Winter seemed to know more than half the company, and when we made our way to the bar, a little fat man in spectacles who was standing by himself offered him a drink. No, you have one with me, Captain, said Winter. He turned to me. I want you to know Captain Butler. The little man shook hands with me. We began to talk, but my attention distracted by my surroundings. I took small notice of him, and after we had each ordered a cocktail, we separated. When we had got into the motor again and were driving away, Winter said to me, I'm glad we ran up against Butler. I wanted you to meet him. What did you think of him? I don't know that I thought very much of him at all, I answered. Do you believe in the supernatural? I don't exactly know that I do, I smiled. A very queer thing happened to him a year or two ago. You ought to have him tell you about it. What sort of thing? Winter did not answer my question. I have no explanation of it myself, he said. But there's no doubt about the facts. Are you interested in things like that? Things like what? Spells and magic and all that. I've never met anyone who wasn't. Winter paused for a moment. I guess I won't tell you myself. You ought to hear it from his own lips so that you can judge. How are you fixed up for tonight? 
I've got nothing on at all. Well, I'll get hold of him between now and then and see if we can't go down to his ship. Winter told me something about him. Captain Butler had spent all his life on the Pacific. He had been in much better circumstances than he was now, for he had been first officer and then captain of a passenger boat plying along the coast of California, but he had lost his ship and a number of passengers had been drowned. Drink, I guess, said Winter. Of course there had been an inquiry which had cost him his certificate, and then he drifted further afield. For some years he had knocked about the South Seas, but he was now in command of a small schooner which sailed between Honolulu and the various islands of the group. It belonged to a Chinese, to whom the fact that his skipper had no certificate meant only that he could be had for lower wages, and to have a white man in charge was always an advantage. And now that I had heard this about him, I took the trouble to remember more exactly what he was like. I recalled his round spectacles and the round blue eyes behind them, and so gradually reconstructed him before my mind. He was a little man, without angles, plump, with a round face like the full moon and a little fat round nose. He had fair short hair, and he was red-faced and clean-shaven. He had plump hands, dimpled on the knuckles, and short, fat legs. He was a jolly soul, and the tragic experience he had gone through seemed to have left him unscarred. Though he must have been thirty-four or thirty-five, he looked much younger. But after all, I had given him but a superficial attention, and now that I knew of this catastrophe, which had obviously ruined his life, I promised myself that when I saw him again, I would take more careful note of him. It is very curious to observe the differences of emotional response that you find in different people. Some can go through terrific battles, the fear of imminent death and unimaginable horrors, and preserve their soul unscathed, while with others the trembling of the moon on a solitary sea or the song of a bird in a thicket will cause a convulsion great enough to transform their entire being. Is it due to strength or weakness, want of imagination, or instability of character? I do not know. When I called up in my fancy that scene of shipwreck, with the shrieks of the drowning and the terror, and then later the ordeal of the inquiry, the bitter grief of those who sorrowed for the lost, and the harsh things he must have read of himself in the papers, the shame and the disgrace, it came to me with a shock to remember that Captain Butler had talked with the frank obscenity of a schoolboy of the Hawaiian girls and of Uli, the Red Light District, and of his successful adventures. He laughed readily, and one would have thought he could never laugh again. I remembered his shining white teeth. They were his best feature. He began to interest me, and thinking of him and of his gay insouciance, I forgot the particular story, to hear which I was to see him again. I wanted to see him rather to find out if I could a little more what sort of man he was. Winter made the necessary arrangements, and after dinner we went down to the waterfront. The ship's boat was waiting for us, and we rowed out. The schooner was anchored some way across the harbour, not far from the breakwater. We came alongside, and I heard the sound of a ukulele. We clambered up the ladder. I guess he's in the cabin, said Winter, leading the way. It was a small cabin, bedraggled and dirty, with a table against one side and a broad bench all round upon which slept, I supposed, such passengers as were ill-advised enough to travel in such a ship. A petroleum lamp gave a dim light. The ukulele was being played by a native girl, and Butler was lolling on the seat, half lying, with his head on her shoulder and an arm round her waist. Don't let us disturb you, Captain, said Winter facetiously. Come right in, said Butler, getting up and shaking hands with us. What'll you have? It was a warm night, and through the open door you saw countless stars in a heaven that was still almost blue. Captain Butler wore a sleeveless undershirt, showing his fat white arms and a pair of incredibly dirty trousers. His feet were bare, but on his curly head he wore a very old, a very shapeless felt hat. Let me introduce you to my girl. Ain't she a peach? We shook hands with a very pretty person. She was a good deal taller than the captain, and even the mother Hubbard, which the missionaries of a past generation had, in the interests of decency, 
forced on the unwilling natives, could not conceal the beauty of her form. One could not but suspect that age would burden her with a certain corpulence, but now she was graceful and alert. Her brown skin had an exquisite translucency, and her eyes were magnificent. Her black hair, very thick and rich, was coiled round her head in a massive plait. When she smiled in a greeting that was charmingly natural, she showed teeth that were small, even, and white. She was certainly a most attractive creature. It was easy to see that the captain was madly in love with her. He could not take his eyes off her. He wanted to touch her all the time. That was very easy to understand, but what seemed to me stranger was that the girl was apparently in love with him. There was a light in her eyes that was unmistakable, and her lips were slightly parted, as though in a sigh of desire. It was thrilling. It was even a little moving, and I could not help feeling somewhat in the way. What had a stranger to do with this lovesick pair? I wished that winter had not brought me, and it seemed to me that the dingy cabin was transfigured, and now it seemed a fit and proper scene for such an extremity of passion. I thought I should never forget that schooner in the harbour of Honolulu, crowded with shipping, and yet, under the immensity of the starry sky, remote from all the world. I like to think of those lovers sailing off together in the night, over the empty spaces of the Pacific, from one green, hilly island to another. A faint breeze of romance softly fanned my cheek. And yet Butler was the last man in the world with whom you would have associated romance, and it was hard to see what there was in him to arouse love. In the clothes he wore now he looked podgier than ever, and his round spectacles gave his round face the look of a prim cherub. He suggested rather a curate who had gone to the dogs. His conversation was peppered with the quaintest Americanisms, and it is because I despair of reproducing these that, at whatever loss of vividness, I mean to narrate the story he told me a little later in my own words. Moreover, he was unable to frame a sentence without an oath, though a good-natured one, and his speech, albeit offensive only to prudish ears, in print would seem coarse. He was a mirth-loving man, and perhaps that accounted not a little for his successful amours, since women, for the most part, frivolous creatures, are excessively bored by the seriousness with which men treat them, and they can seldom resist the buffoon who makes them laugh. Their sense of humour is crude. Diana of Ephesus is always prepared to fling prudence to the winds for the red-nosed comedian who sits on his hat. I realised that Captain Butler had charm. If I had not known the tragic story of the shipwreck, I should have thought he had never had a care in his life. Our host had rung the bell on our entrance, and now a Chinese cook came in with more glasses and several bottles of soda. The whiskey and the captain's empty glass stood already on the table. But when I saw the Chinese, I positively started, for he was certainly the ugliest man I had ever seen. He was very short, but thick-set, and he had a bad limp. He wore a singlet and a pair of trousers that had been white, but were now filthy, and perched on a shock of bristly grey hair, an old tweed deer-stalker. It would have been grotesque on any Chinese, but on him it was outrageous. His broad, square face was very flat, as though it had been bashed in by a mighty fist, and it was deeply pitted with smallpox. But the most revolting thing in him was a very pronounced hair-lip, which had never been operated on, so that his upper lip, cleft, went up in an angle to his nose, and in the opening was a huge yellow fang. It was horrible. He came in with the end of a cigarette at the corner of his mouth, and this, I do not know why, gave him a devilish expression. He poured out the whiskey and opened a bottle of soda. Don't drown it, John, said the captain. He said nothing, but handed a glass to each of us. Then he went out. I saw you looking at my chink, said Butler, with a grin on his fat, shining face. I should hate to meet him on a dark night, I said. He sure is homely, said the captain, and for some reason he seemed to say it with a peculiar satisfaction. But he's fine for one thing, I'll tell the world. You just have to have a drink every time you look at him. But my eyes fell on a calabash that hung against the wall over the table, and I got up to look at it. I had been hunting for an old one, 
and this was better than any I had seen outside the museum. It was given me by a chief over on one of the islands, said the captain, watching me. I'd done him a good turn, and he wanted to give me something good. He certainly did, I answered. I was wondering whether I could discreetly make Captain Butler an offer for it. I could not imagine that he set any store on such an article, when, as though he read my thoughts, he said, I wouldn't sell that for ten thousand dollars. I guess not, said Winter. It would be a crime to sell it. Why? I asked. That comes into the story, returned Winter. Doesn't it, Captain? It surely does. Let's hear it then. The night's young yet, he answered. The night distinctly lost its youth before he satisfied my curiosity, and meanwhile we drank a great deal too much whiskey while Captain Butler narrated his experiences of San Francisco in the old days and of the South Seas. At last the girl fell asleep. She lay curled up on the seat with her face on her brown arm and her bosom rose and fell gently with her breathing. In sleep she looked sullen but darkly beautiful. He had found her on one of the islands in the group, among which, whenever there was cargo to be got, he wandered with his crazy old schooner. The Kanakas have little love for work, and the laborious Chinese, the cunning Japs, have taken the trade out of their hands. Her father had a strip of land on which he grew taro and bananas, and he had a boat in which he went fishing. He was vaguely related to the mate of the schooner, and it was he who took Captain Butler up to the shabby little frame house to spend an idle evening. They took a bottle of whiskey with them and the ukulele. The captain was not a shy man, and when he saw a pretty girl he made love to her. He could speak the native language fluently, and it was not long before he had overcome the girl's timidity. They spent the evening singing and dancing, and by the end of it she was sitting by his side, and he had his arm round her waist. It happened that they were delayed on the island for several days, and the captain, at no time a man to hurry, made no effort to shorten his stay. He was very comfortable in the snug little harbour, and life was long. He had a swim round his ship in the morning, and another in the evening. There was a chandler's shop on the waterfront, where sailormen could get a drink of whisky, and he spent the best part of the day there, playing cribbage with the half-caste who owned it. At night, the mate and he went up to the house where the pretty girl lived, and they sang a song or two and told stories. It was the girl's father who suggested that he should take her away with him. They discussed the matter in a friendly fashion, while the girl, nestling against the captain, urged him by the pressure of her hands and her soft, smiling glances. He had taken a fancy to her, and he was a domestic man. He was a little dull sometimes at sea, and it would be very pleasant to have a pretty little creature like that about the old ship. He was of a practical turn, too, and he recognised that it would be useful to have someone around to darn his socks and look after his linen. He was tired of having his things washed by a chink who tore everything to pieces. The natives washed much better, and now and then when the captain went ashore at Honolulu, he liked to cut a dash in a smart duck suit. It was only a matter of arranging a price. The father wanted two hundred and fifty dollars, and the captain, never a thrifty man, could not put his hand on such a sum. But he was a generous one, and with the girl's soft face against his, he was not inclined to haggle. He offered to give a hundred and fifty dollars there, and then, and another hundred in three months. There was a good deal of argument, and the parties could not come to any agreement that night, but the idea had fired the captain, and he could not sleep as well as usual. He kept dreaming of the lovely girl, and each time he awoke it was with the pressure of her soft, sensual lips on his. He cursed himself in the morning because a bad night at poker the last time he was at Honolulu had left him so short of ready money. And if the night before he had been in love with the girl, this morning he was crazy about her. See here, bananas, he said to the mate. I've got to have that girl. You go and tell the old man I'll bring the dough up tonight and she can get fixed up. I figure we'll be ready to sail at dawn. I have no idea why the mate was known by that eccentric name. He was called Wheeler, but though he had that English surname, there was not a drop of white blood in him. He was a tall man, and well made though inclined to stoutness, but much darker than is usual in Hawaii.
He was no longer young, and his crisply curling, thick hair was grey. His upper front teeth were cased in gold. He was very proud of them. He had a marked squint, and this gave him a saturnine expression. The captain, who was fond of a joke, found in it a constant source of humour, and hesitated the less to rally him on the defect, because he realised that the mate was sensitive about it. Bananas, unlike most of the natives, was a taciturn fellow, and Captain Butler would have disliked him if it had been possible for a man of his good nature to dislike anyone. He liked to be at sea with someone he could talk to. He was a chatty, sociable creature, and it was enough to drive a missionary to drink to live there day after day with a chap who never opened his mouth. He did his best to wake the mate up, that is to say, he chaffed him without mercy, but it was poor fun to laugh by oneself, and he came to the conclusion that, drunk or sober, Bananas was no fit companion for a white man. But he was a good seaman, and the captain was shrewd enough to know the value of a mate he could trust. It was not rare for him to come aboard, when they were sailing, fit for nothing but to fall into his bunk, and it was worth something to know that he could stay there till he had slept his liquor off, since Bananas could be relied on. But he was an unsociable devil, and it would be a treat to have someone he could talk to. That girl would be fine. Besides, he wouldn't be so likely to get drunk when he went ashore if he knew there was a little girl waiting for him when he came on board again. He went to his friend the Chandler, and over a peg of gin asked him for a loan. There were one or two useful things a ship's captain could do for a ship's Chandler, and after a quarter of an hour's conversation in low tones, there is no object in letting all and sundry know your business. The captain crammed a wad of notes in his hip pocket, and that night, when he went back to his ship, the girl went with him. What Captain Butler, seeking for reasons to do what he had already made up his mind to, had anticipated, actually came to pass. He did not give up drinking, but he ceased to drink to excess. An evening with the boys, when he had been away from town two or three weeks, was pleasant enough, but it was pleasant too to get back to his little girl. He thought of her, sleeping so softly, and how, when he got into his cabin and leaned over her, she would open her eyes lazily and stretch out her arms for him. It was as good as a full hand. He found he was saving money, and since he was a generous man, he did the right thing by the little girl. He gave her some silver-backed brushes for her long hair and a gold chain and a reconstructed ruby for her finger. Gee, but it was good to be alive. A year went by, a whole year, and he was not tired of her yet. He was not a man who analysed his feelings, but this was so surprising that it forced itself upon his attention. There must be something very wonderful about that girl. He couldn't help seeing that he was more wrapped up in her than ever, and sometimes the thought entered his mind that it might not be a bad thing if he married her. Then, one day, the mate did not come in to dinner or to tea. Butler did not bother himself about his absence at the first meal, but at the second he asked the Chinese cook, Where's the mate? He no come tea. No want she, said the chink. He ain't sick? No savvy. Next day, Bananas turned up again, but he was more sullen than ever, and after dinner, the captain asked the girl what was the matter with him. She smiled and shrugged her pretty shoulders. She told the captain that Bananas had taken a fancy to her, and he was sore because she had told him off. The captain was a good-humoured man, and he was not of a jealous nature. It struck him as exceeding funny that Bananas should be in love. A man who had a squint like that had a precious poor chance. When tea came round, he chaffed him gaily. He pretended to speak in the air so that the mate should not be certain that he knew anything, but he dealt him some pretty shrewd blows. The girl did not think him as funny as he thought himself, and afterwards she begged him to say nothing more. He was surprised at her seriousness. She told him he did not know her people. When their passion was aroused, they were capable of anything. She was a little frightened. This was so absurd to him that he laughed heartily. If he comes bothering round you, you just threaten to tell me. That'll fix him. Better fire him, I think. Not on your sweet life. I know a good sailor when I see one. But if he don't leave you alone, I'll give him the worst licking he's ever had. Perhaps the girl had a wisdom unusual in her sex. 
She knew that it was useless to argue with a man when his mind was made up, for it only increased his stubbornness, and she held her peace. And now, on the shabby schooner, threading her way across the silent sea, among those lovely islands, was enacted a dark, tense drama of which the fat little captain remained entirely ignorant. The girl's resistance fired bananas so that he ceased to be a man, but was simply blind desire. He did not make love to her gently or gaily, but with a black and savage ferocity. Her contempt now was changed to hatred, and when he besought her, she answered him with bitter, angry taunts. But the struggle went on silently, and when the captain asked her after a little while whether Bananas was bothering her, she lied. But one night, when they were in Honolulu, he came on board only just in time. They were sailing at dawn. Bananas had been ashore, drinking some native spirit, and he was drunk. The captain, rowing up, heard sounds that surprised him. He scrambled up the ladder. He saw Bananas beside himself trying to wrench open the cabin door. He was shouting at the girl. He swore he would kill her if she did not let him in. What in hell are you up to? cried Butler. The mate let go the handle, gave the captain a look of savage hate, and without a word turned away. Stop here! What are you doing with that door? The mate still did not answer. He looked at him with sullen, bootless rage. I'll teach you not to pull any of your queer stuff with me, you dirty, cross-eyed nigger, said the captain. He was a good foot shorter than the mate, and no match for him, but he was used to dealing with native crews, and he had his knuckle-duster handy. Perhaps it was not an instrument that a gentleman would use, but then Captain Butler was not a gentleman, nor was he in the habit of dealing with gentlemen. Before Bananas knew what the captain was at, his right arm had shot out, and his fist, with its ring of steel, caught him fair and square on the jaw. He fell like a bull under the pole-axe. That'll learn him, said the captain. Bananas did not stir. The girl unlocked the cabin door and came out. Is he dead? He ain't. He called a couple of men and told them to carry the mate to his bunk. He rubbed his hands with satisfaction, and his round blue eyes gleamed behind his spectacles. But the girl was strangely silent. She put her arms round him as though to protect him from invisible harm. It was two or three days before Bananas was on his feet again, and when he came out of his cabin, his face was torn and swollen. Through the darkness of his skin, you saw the livid bruise. Butler saw him slinking along the deck and called him. The mate went to him without a word. See here, Bananas, he said to him, fixing his spectacles on his slippery nose, for it was very hot. I ain't going to fire you for this, but you know now that when I hit, I hit hard. Don't forget it, and don't let me have any more funny business. Then he held out his hand and gave the mate that good-humoured, flashing smile of his, which was his greatest charm. The mate took the outstretched hand and twitched his swollen lips into a devilish grin. The incident in the captain's mind was so completely finished that when the three of them sat at dinner, he chaffed bananas on his appearance. He was eating with difficulty, and his swollen face still more distorted by pain, he looked truly a repulsive object. That evening, when he was sitting on the upper deck, smoking his pipe, a shiver passed through the captain. I don't know what I should be shivering for on a night like this, he grumbled. Maybe I've gotten a dose of fever. I've been feeling a bit queer all day. When he went to bed, he took some quinine, and next morning he felt better, but a little washed out, as though he were recovering from a debauch. I guess my liver's out of order, he said, and he took a pill. He had not much appetite that day, and towards evening he began to feel very unwell. He tried the next remedy he knew, which was to drink two or three hot whiskies, but that did not seem to help him much, and when in the morning he surveyed himself in the glass, he thought he was not looking quite the thing. If I ain't right by the time we get back to Honolulu, I'll just give Dr. Denby a call. He'll sure fix me up. He could not eat. He felt a great lassitude in all his limbs. He slept soundly enough, but he awoke with no sense of refreshment. On the contrary, he felt a peculiar exhaustion. 
and the energetic little man, who could not bear the thought of lying in bed, had to make an effort to force himself out of his bunk. After a few days, he found it impossible to resist the languor that oppressed him, and he made up his mind not to get up. Bananas can look after the ship, he said. He has before now. He laughed a little to himself as he thought how often he had lain speechless in his bunk after a night with the boys. That was before he had his girl. He smiled at her and pressed her hand. She was puzzled and anxious. He saw that she was concerned about him and tried to reassure her. He had never had a day's illness in his life, and in a week at the outside, he would be as right as rain. I wish you'd fired bananas, she said. I've got a feeling that he's at the bottom of this. Damned good thing I didn't, or there'd be no one to sail the ship. I know a good sailor when I see one. His blue eyes, rather pale now, with the whites all yellow, twinkled. You don't think he's trying to poison me, little girl? She did not answer, but she had one or two talks with the Chinese cook, and she took great care with the captain's food. But he ate little enough now, and it was only with the greatest difficulty that she persuaded him to drink a cup of soup two or three times a day. It was clear that he was very ill, he was losing weight quickly, and his chubby face was pale and drawn. He suffered no pain, but merely grew every day weaker and more languid. He was wasting away. The round trip on this occasion lasted about four weeks, and by the time they came to Honolulu, the captain was a little anxious about himself. He had not been out of his bed for more than a fortnight, and really he felt too weak to get up and go to the doctor. He sent a message asking him to come on board. The doctor examined him, but could find nothing to account for his condition. His temperature was normal. See here, Captain, he said. I'll be perfectly frank with you. I don't know what's the matter with you, and just seeing you like this don't give me a chance. You come into the hospital so that we can keep you under observation. There's nothing organically wrong with you, I know that, and my impression is that a few weeks in hospital ought to put you to rights. I ain't going to leave my ship. Chinese owners were queer customers, he said. If he left his ship because he was sick, his owner might fire him, and he couldn't afford to lose his job. So long as he stayed where he was, his contract safeguarded him, and he had a first-rate mate. Besides, he couldn't leave his girl. No man could want a better nurse. If anyone could pull him through, she would. Every man had to die once, and he only wished to be left in peace. He would not listen to the doctor's expostulations, and finally the doctor gave in. I'll write you a prescription, he said doubtfully, and see if it does you any good. You'd better stay in bed for a while. There ain't much fear of my getting up, Doc, answered the captain. I feel as weak as a cat. But he believed in the doctor's prescription as little as did the doctor himself, and when he was alone, amused himself by lighting his cigar with it. He had to get amusement out of something, for his cigar tasted like nothing on earth, and he smoked only to persuade himself that he was not too ill to. That evening a couple of friends of his, masters of tramp steamers, hearing he was sick, came to see him. They discussed his case over a bottle of whiskey and a box of Philippine cigars. One of them remembered how a mate of his had been taken queer just like that, and not a doctor in the United States had been able to cure him. He had seen in the paper an advertisement of a patent medicine and thought there'd be no harm in trying it. That man was as strong as ever he'd been in his life after two bottles. But his illness had given Captain Butler a lucidity which was new and strange, and while they talked, he seemed to read their minds. They thought he was dying, and when they left him, he was afraid. The girl saw his weakness. This was her opportunity. She had been urging him to let a native doctor see him, and he had stoutly refused. But now she entreated him. He listened with harassed eyes. He wavered. It was very funny that the American doctor could not tell what was the matter with him. But he did not want her to think that he was scared. If he let a damned nigger come along and look at him, it was to comfort her. He told her to do what she liked. The native doctor came the next night. The captain was lying alone, half awake, and the cabin was dimly lit by an oil lamp. The door was softly opened, and the girl came in on tiptoe. She held the door open, and someone slipped in silently behind her. 
The captain smiled at this mystery, but he was so. Weak now, the smile was no more than a glimmer in his eyes. The doctor was a little, old man, very thin and very wrinkled, with a completely bald head and the face of a monkey. He was bowed and gnarled like an old tree. He looked hardly human, but his eyes were very bright, and in the half-darkness they seemed to glow with a reddish light. He was dressed filthily in a pair of ragged dungarees, and the upper part of his body was naked. He sat down on his haunches and for ten minutes looked at the captain. Then he felt the palms of his hands and the soles of his feet. The girl watched him with frightened eyes. No word was spoken. Then he asked for something that the captain had worn. The girl gave him the old felt hat, which the captain used constantly, and taking it, he sat down again on the floor, clasping it firmly with both hands, and rocking backwards and forwards slowly, he muttered some gibberish in a very low tone. At last, he gave a little sigh and dropped the hat. He took an old pipe out of his trouser pocket and lit it. The girl went over to him and sat by his side. He whispered something to her, and she started violently. For a few minutes they talked in hurried undertones, and then they stood up. She gave him money and opened the door for him. He slid out as silently as he had come in. Then she went over to the captain and leaned over him so that she could speak into his ear. It's an enemy praying you to death. Don't talk fool stuff, girlie, he said impatiently. It's truth. It's God's truth. That's why the American doctor couldn't do anything. Our people can do that. I've seen it done. I thought you were safe because you were a white man. I haven't an enemy. Bananas. What's he want to pray me to death for? You ought to have fired him before he had a chance. I guess if I ain't got nothing more the matter with me than bananas who do, I shall be sitting up and taking nourishment in a very few days. She was silent for a while, and she looked at him intently. Don't you know you're dying? she said to him at last. That was what the two skippers had thought, but they hadn't said it. A shiver passed across the captain's wan face. The doctor says there ain't nothing really the matter with me. I've only to lie quiet for a bit, and I shall be all right. She put her lips to his ear as if she were afraid that the air itself might hear. You're dying, dying, dying. You'll pass out with the old moon. That's something to know. You'll pass out with the old moon unless Bananas dies before. He was not a timid man, and he had recovered already from the shock her words, and still more her vehement, silent manner had given him. Once more a smile flickered in his eyes. I guess I'll take my chance, girlie. There's twelve days before the new moon. There was something in her tone that gave him an idea. See here, my girl, this is all bunk. I don't believe a word of it, but I don't want you to try any of your monkey tricks with bananas. He ain't a beauty, but he's a first-rate mate. He would have said a good deal more, but he was tired out. He suddenly felt very weak and faint. It was always at that hour that he felt worse. He closed his eyes. The girl watched him for a minute and then slipped out of the cabin. The moon, nearly full, made a silver pathway over the dark sea. It shone from an unclouded sky. She looked at it with terror, for she knew that with its death, the man she loved would die. His life was in her hands. She could save him. She alone could save him. But the enemy was cunning, and she must be cunning too. She felt that someone was looking at her, and without turning, by the sudden fear that seized her, knew that from the shadow the burning eyes of the mate were fixed upon her. She did not know what he could do. If he could read her thoughts, she was defeated already and with a desperate effort she emptied her mind of all content. His death alone could save her lover, and she could bring his death about. She knew that if he could be brought to look into a calabash in which was water, so that a reflection of him was made, and the reflection were broken by hurtling the water, he would die as though he had been struck by lightning, for the reflection was his soul. But none knew better than he the danger and he could be made to look only by a guile which had lulled his least suspicion. He must never think that he had an enemy who was on the watch to cause his destruction. She knew what she had to do, but the time was short, the time 
was terribly short. Presently, she realized that the mate had gone. She breathed more freely. Two days later, they sailed, and there were ten now before the new moon. Captain Butler was terrible to see. He was nothing but skin and bone, and he could not move without help. He could hardly speak, but she dared do nothing yet. She knew that she must be patient. The mate was cunning, cunning. They went to one of the smaller islands of the group and discharged cargo, and now there were only seven days more. The moment had come to start. She brought some things out of the cabin she shared with the captain and made them into a bundle. She put the bundle in the deck cabin where she and Bananas ate their meals, and at dinner time, when she went in, he turned quickly and she saw that he had been looking at it. Neither of them spoke, but she knew what he suspected. She was making her preparations to leave the ship. He looked at her mockingly. Gradually, as though to prevent the captain from knowing what she was about, she brought everything she owned into the cabin and some of the captain's clothes and made them all into bundles. At last, Bananas could keep silence no longer. He pointed to a suit of ducks. What are you going to do with that? he asked. She shrugged her shoulders. I'm going back to my island. He gave a laugh that distorted his grim face. The captain was dying, and she meant to get away with all she could lay hands on. What'll you do if I say you can't take those things? They're the captains. They're no use to you, she said. There was a calabash hanging on the wall. It was the very calabash I had seen when I came into the cabin and which we had talked about. She took it down. It was all dusty, so she poured water into it from the water bottle and rinsed it with her fingers. What are you doing with that? I can sell it for fifty dollars, she said. If you want to take it, you'll have to pay me. What do you want? You know what I want. She allowed a fleeting smile to play on her lips. She flashed a quick look at him and quickly turned away. He gave a gasp of desire. She raised her shoulders in a little shrug. With a savage bound, he sprang upon her and seized her in his arms. Then she laughed. She put her arms, her soft, round arms, about his neck and surrendered herself to him voluptuously. When the morning came, she roused him out of a deep sleep. The early rays of the sun slanted into the cabin. He pressed her to his heart. Then he told her that the captain could not last more than a day or two, and the owner wouldn't so easily find another white man to command the ship. If Bananas offered to take less money, he would get the job, and the girl could stay with him. He looked at her with love-sick eyes. She nestled up against him. She kissed his lips, in the foreign way, in the way the captain had taught her to kiss, and she promised to stay. Bananas was drunk with happiness. It was now or never. She got up and went to the table to arrange her hair. There was no mirror, and she looked into the calabash, seeking for her reflection. She tidied her beautiful hair. Then she beckoned to Bananas to come to her. She pointed to the calabash. There's something in the bottom of it, she said. Instinctively, without suspecting anything, Bananas looked full into the water. His face was reflected in it. In a flash, she beat upon it violently with both her hands so that they pounded on the bottom and the water splashed up. The reflection was broken in pieces. Bananas started back with a sudden hoarse cry and he looked at the girl. She was standing there with a look of triumphant hatred on her face. A horror came into his eyes. His heavy features were twisted in agony and with a thud, as though he had taken a violent poison, he crumpled up onto the ground. A great shudder passed through his body and he was still. She leaned over him callously. She put her hand on his heart and then she pulled down his lower eyelid. He was quite dead. She went into the cabin in which lay Captain Butler. There was a faint colour in his cheeks, and he looked at her in a startled way. What's happened? he whispered. They were the first words he had spoken for forty-eight hours. Nothing's happened, she said. I feel all funny. Then his eyes closed and he fell asleep. He slept for a day and a night, and when he awoke, he asked for food. In a fortnight, he was well. It was past midnight when Winter and I rowed back to shore and we had drunk innumerable whiskies and sodas. What do you think of it all? asked Winter. What a question, 
If you mean, have I any explanation to suggest, I haven't. The captain believes every word of it. That's obvious. But you know that's not the part that interests me most, whether it's true or not, and what it all means. The part that interests me is that such things should happen to such people. I wonder what there is in that commonplace little man to arouse such a passion in that lovely creature. As I watched her, asleep there, while he was telling the story, I had some fantastic idea about the power of love being able to work miracles. But that's not the girl, said Winter. What on earth do you mean? Didn't you notice the cook? Of course I did. He's the ugliest man I ever saw. That's why Butler took him. The girl ran away with the Chinese cook last year. This is a new one. He's only had her there about two months. Well, I'm hanged. He thinks this cook is safe, but I wouldn't be too sure in his place. There's something about a chink when he lays himself out to please a woman she can't resist him. 